Get your Bibles in your hand. We're going to have our confession tonight. Say, this is my Bible. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. I can be who it says I can be. My mind's alert. My heart is receptive to receive the uncompromising, the unchanging, the infallible seed of the Word of God. For this is God's Word speaking to me. And I'm going to be a doer of the Word and not a hearer only. You may be seated if you can. I love coming to church. Especially on Wednesday nights, I love coming to church and we do some Bible teaching on Wednesday night and uh, we appreciate you coming out in this wonderful weather we're having. Hallelujah. <laughs> we need to bind this weather. Amen. Yeah, we got plenty of rain, but you know the earth needs the earth needs to be fed too. So Hallelujah. God is good and his mercy endures forever. Um, tonight's message is called, entitled, Being Covenant-Minded. And um, I got into this message when we was doing the uh, marriage class in the back for a few weeks. And um, it, was, we, it was a really good marriage class. It got me dialed into the Word and doing a lot of studying. But if I do want to encourage you, if you ha didn't get the chance to do that marriage class, or you did do it and you want that jump drive, we have all those marriage classes on one jump drive. It's eight classes on one jump drive, and it's $25. So you just go by the information center and get that. I guarantee you it will be a blessing to you. But I got the idea of that because we was talking about a covenant marriage versus a contract marriage. And I started researching and studying on the covenants and things. And I just, uh, after the class, of course, I, I kept going with it. So I'm going to give you what um, that I have, and I know it's going to be a blessing to you because there's a lot of, a lot of scriptures in the Bible that talks about the covenants and what the covenant is, you know. And um, the simple definition of a covenant is, is a promise. Covenant is a promise, simple definition. In the biblical sense, the word covenant derives from the same root word meaning to cut. That means that in the culture of the Bible, covenant carried weight. It carried, uh, is very influential, it was very important. And it was often, uh, they often used they often would use the, uh, the cutting method uh, or the sealed method, and it would be also in relationship to the blood covenant. And so we're going to dive into that tonight, but the simple definition of covenant is a promise. A covenant is not a contract, and we talked about that in marriage class and the difference in the contract. Contract is a, is a I will if you will exchange. If, you, if you, some of you business people know what I'm talking about when it goes to contracts, it's based on I'll do this if you do that. But that's not what a covenant is. A covenant is a promise to. Um, I'm, it's like I'm going to do my best to make this happen. It's not necessarily a mutual agreement, but it's a choice that you make to benefit or the benefit of someone else. It is not a mutual agreement for mutual benefits promised. It is a choice that you make to benefit someone else without concern whether it will benefit you or not. So that relates to, and the best example you can use is a, is a marriage covenant. And that's, uh, you know, you, you, you promise to do this. You say your vows till death do us part. I promise to cherish you and love you until death do you part. That is a covenant that you're getting into when you get into a marriage. It's not a contract. It is a covenant. God, God ordained marriages, and he ordained the covenant. We're going to talk about that later on. But tonight, we're going to look at God is a God of covenant relationships. I said God is a God of covenant relationships. So we're going to look at some significant covenants to lay a foundation. Is And I, I was thinking, what better way to understand the covenant uh, to, to relate to what God says? In other words, this Bible is the mind of Christ. So what better way to understand what the word covenant, what covenant means, is to get into the mind of Christ himself. So we're going to start off with uh, the, the Noahic covenant. But I want to say this. Keeping covenant qualifies us to receive the blessings from God. 
Let me say it again. Keeping the covenant qualifies us to receive the blessings that God has promised us. Our covenant also guides us and leads us and directs us in the way that we should go. And it also keeps us, um, it guides us and keeps us through temptation. It keeps us from sinning when we operate in the covenant of Christ. Are you with me? So let's get look at the first covenant in the Bible. Some say it was the Adam covenant, but not, I'm, I'll say it's the Noah covenant. Let's look at Noah covenant, and we're going to go to Genesis chapter 9, verses 9 through 17. And it says this. And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. Now, this was when, you know, the earth was destroyed by the flood. And verse 10 says, And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, the beasts of the earth, with you, all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Verse 11, Thus I will establish my covenant with you. I will make a promise to you, is what he's saying. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Verse 12. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud. And it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Some of you have often wondered, what's the rainbow for? Well, the rainbow is a sign of the covenant. It's a sign of the covenant. That you will remember the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in that cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never, never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. In verse 17, God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all the flesh that is on the earth. Now, this Noahic covenant is an unconditional covenant or unconditional promise because it does not depend upon anything that Noah or his descendants had to do in order to fulfill this covenant. It was not based on what Noah did. It was not based on what his descendants will do. It was based upon the word of God, what he said. It was a promise. This promise was based on God's faithfulness alone. Not on anything human man can do or humanity can do. It was based on God's faithfulness. Because of God's faithfulness to always do what he promises, we can know without a shadow of a doubt that there will never be a worldwide flood as there was in the days of Noah. It will never happen. No matter how bad things get, neither the wickedness, listen to this, neither the wickedness nor the righteousness of mankind can ever affect the unconditional covenant. That means no, how my, no, no matter how spiritual you get or how bad the wicked people get, it's not going to affect God's covenant, what he promised. This doesn't mean that earth will never be destroyed. It means that the earth will never be destroyed by a flood. It's important to note here that just like Noah and his family were saved from this destruction through the ark. We know that Noah and his family were saved. You and I have been saved from the destruction through the blood of Jesus Christ. Noah and his family were saved from the wrath of God that came in the flood. The wrath of God came by the flood. You and I are saved from the wrath to come through Christ Jesus. I was thinking about the flood today, and well, it wasn't today, this week. I've been thinking about it. And, you know, it's interesting. The same, the same water that destroyed mankind was the same water that saved mankind. Isn't that interesting? Think about that. The same water that destroyed the earth, all mankind, all living creatures except for the ones that was on 
the ark was the same waters that end up saving mankind. The difference was the ones on the ark was in the right position. And being in the right position was based on what they believed. The ones in the ark believed that Jesus died, that Jesus was a son of, well, not Jesus was a son of God. He wasn't a son of God then, but there was a God, and there was no other. And they believed that. And the ones that didn't believe that perished. Remember, they made fun of Noah because he was building ark. And those ones end up perishing because they didn't believe. So the ones on the ark believed that Christ was alive and he was real. So it says here in 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says that Jesus, who was raised from the dead, delivers us from the wrath to come. There is judgment day coming. There is wrath coming. You've heard me say this before. There is a heaven, but also there is a hell. A lot of people don't believe that, but my Bible says there is a hell. And the only way to be delivered from the wrath to come is through Christ Jesus. Amen? Let's go to Luke 17. And I want you to see this. This was Jesus actually teaching here himself jesus was teaching them talking about he's going back and he's comparing what is to come to the noah covenant and it says this in verse 26 no i mean luke 17 verse 26 and as it was in the days of noah so it will be also in the days of the son of man they ate they drank they married wives they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed all of them. Verse 28, likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed all of them. And verse 30 says, Even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. People, I'm here to tell you tonight, there's not going to be a warning. There's not going to be an a, a, a airplane that goes over the head and has a banner, Christ is coming at 5 o'clock. It's not going to happen that way. The Bible says it's going to be in a twinkling of an eye. So this is the only warning you get is now. I'm telling you, we're in the last days. Amen. Christ is coming. I said Christ is coming. His word is true, yes, and amen. Hallelujah. I said Christ is coming. Glory be to God. Genesis 6, 5 says this, that the wickedness of man, this is talking about, in the days of Noah, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was continually evil. That's what it was in the days of Noah. He said that's how it's going to be in the last days. We're living in, a, a, in days now that there's a lot of intent of evilness continually. Are we not? So we see the parallel. Isn't that something? Jesus referred back to the Noah covenant, said in the days of Noah that, that people was evil. He, he even was, uh, he was, he, he was, what's the word I'm looking for? He was not rejected, but he was disappointed that he had made mankind. Uh, he wasn't, he, God didn't make a mistake making man. Don't get me wrong. He didn't make a mistake making mankind. He was disappointed that mankind had made the choices that they made and were making those choices. Just like he's disappointed today that mankind is making choices that doesn't line up with the Word of God. So God creates the covenant to establish a relationship with His people. If you look at, when I go through these covenants, the covenant is based on establishing a relationship with people. Are you with me tonight? Now let's look at, um, let's go to the Abraham covenant. The Abraham Covenant is in Genesis chapter 17. We're going to look at verse 1 through 7. It says, When Abram was 99 years old, 
The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am a mighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. And this covenant was conditional, right? He said, if you walk before me and be blameless, I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Now, he's 99 years old here. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him continually, saying, As for me, Jesus says, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Verse 5, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations nations i will make you exceedingly fruitful and i will make nations of you and kings shall come from you and i will establish my covenant between me and you and and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant what does everlasting mean Lasting forever. Everlasting covenant, lasting forever. To be God to you and your descendants after you. Now we see here this covenant, or you could say this promise of blessing to Abraham, to Abraham's seed and to the nations through Abraham, really is the beginning of the covenant of grace that's going to find its ultimate fulfillment in Christ Jesus. So he's prophesying that your descendants are going to be blessed your descendants are going to establish my covenant, and you're going to continue to be a blessing. Not only I'm going to be a blessing to you, but I'm going to be a blessing to your descendants. Are you with me tonight? The covenant, the promise of blessing to Abraham, to Abraham's seed, and to the nations through Abraham, really is the beginning of the covenant and the grace that's going to find its ultimate fulfillment in Christ Jesus. Now, let's look at the three tenets of this covenant. Because there's a lot in this covenant. Number one, to make from Abraham a great nation and bless Abraham and bless his name great so that he will be a blessing. So we know that this part of the covenant is for Abraham to be a blessing. He said he will bless those who bless him and curse those who curse him. And listen to this, and all the people on earth. Not some of the people on earth. All of the people on earth will be blessed through Abraham. That means everyone has the potential to follow in Abraham's blessing. All the people. How many all people we have here tonight? Some of you didn't raise your hand, but you're all the people that he's talking about. Hallelujah. Amen. The tenant number two, to give Abraham's descendants all the land from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates. Later, this land came to be referred as the promised land or the land of Israel. He promised Abraham a nation. What he was saying, I'm, 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 I'm kind of paraphrasing. I promise I'm going to give you a land and I'm going to give you a nation and the nation is going to be called Israel. Did he not say that? Tenet number three, to make Abraham the father of many nations and of many descendants. Now, Abraham was 99 years old, and he's telling him he's going to have many descendants. And give the whole land of Canaan to his descendants. The land of Canaan is the promised land, which was Israel. The Lord repeated this covenant promise to three generations. He, repeated, he, he said it to Abraham, he repeated it to Isaac, and he repeated it to Jacob. Same promise, same covenant. All three were promised land, all three were promised many descendants, and all three were promised blessings from the Lord. The land of Canaan, which was the promised land, that was supernaturally given to Abraham and to his descendants was not only a blessing, but also a reminder to the people of Israel of the covenant of Abraham so we are still talking about today the covenant that was made to Abraham that's how powerful it was God is a God of covenant God is a covenant God and if God's a God of covenant we should be 
covenant people. Hallelujah. Described in Scripture as a land flowing with milk and honey, the, 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 the promised land, was, the soil was so rich for agriculture and shepherding, the mountains provided security and protection from the elements and their enemies, and the arid climate provided perfect conditions for livestock to, to thrive. So the Israelites... They had nothing, they, they were lacking nothing, the Israelites. When they, God gave them this land, he didn't just give them just any kind of land. He gave them a land of milk and honey, which means it was very prosperous. And today, they still grow the biggest fruit over in Israel than they do anywhere in the world. You wouldn't think so by looking at it, but there's a blessing on the nation of Israel. And there will always be a blessing on the nation of Israel. And Israel will never be defeated. I said Israel will never be defeated because of the covenant that God said. It can't happen because God's promises is yes and amen. Are you with me tonight? So we see here starting, and actually if you start in Genesis 12, we begin to see that God starts to fulfill those covenant promises. At the beginning, the blessings and the promises are centered around Abraham personally. He and his wife Sarah were barren. And God miraculously brings about the conception of Isaac. And Sarah's past the normal age of giving birth to children. But God provides a miracle. I said God provides a miracle in that situation. And Isaac was born. God's blessing is evident in Abraham's personal life, is it not? Now, as Abraham's descendants begin to multiply, we see if we go to Exodus, God's hand is upon his descendants. Remember, he says, not only am I going to bless you, but I'm going to bless the descendants after you. They are greatly increasing. Uh, Israel, Israel, Israelites are greatly increasing in Egypt where they are made slaves. And God comes in and he delivers the Israelites from Egypt and brings them out and eventually into the land of Canaan. He establishes the descendants of Israel into a kingdom. He establishes them into a nation, which was the nation of Israel. So we see that the blessings of Abraham are being fulfilled, not only in his personal life, but in his descendants as well. God's promises will never not come to pass. Amen? Let's look at the Mosaic covenant. We're going right through this pretty quickly. We're going to the Mosaic covenant. We can see by now that God's covenant continues to be reestablished. When Moses brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, God basically reestablishes his covenant once again. Let's go to Exodus chapter 19. God is a God of covenant relationship. Exodus chapter 19. I'm going to read verse 3 and six, three through 6. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Yet You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, listen to this, verse 5. Therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my, what? Covenant. Then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine. God owns all the earth. And the fullness thereof. He owns everything. Amen. Verse 6. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. God was giving instructions to Moses and say, this is what I want you to tell them. They were acting up, and he said, this is what I want you to tell them. And we see here, let's go to Exodus chapter 24, Israel affirms the covenant. In other words, what affirm mean? Affirm means to express agreement with or to confirm 
or some of you real estate people know, to ratify. It means to ratify when you come to an agreement, right? Or you accept as a valid transaction. So we see here in Exodus chapter 24, Moses does what God told him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice. They were united together. All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. In verse 5, Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. They were sealing the covenant here. Verse 7, Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, listen to what the people said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant, which has the Lord has made you according to all these words. So we see here that the covenant was once again reestablished. You getting a you getting a feel for what's going on here? Every time God wants a covenant, he's 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 wanting a relationship with his people. Amen. He wants his people to be obedient to his word. He wants the people to walk in his ways. That's what the covenant, he's wanting a covenant with them. He's wanting a, a relationship. Are you with me? But we know that, that didn't, the people didn't fulfill their agreement, don't we? Remember the 12 spies? They, went, they got close. God promised them to go to the land. They're going to give them the land of milk and honey. He promised them that he would give them a nation. Did he not? But because of the people's disobedience and their unbelief, it kept them from establishing that covenant that God had promised them. Because this covenant was based on conditions. If you obey me and keep my commandment and believe that my covenant is yes, true, and amen, then I will bless you and you can go to the land of milk and honey. But remember the 12 spies that went over to the, to the promised land? They came back, right? Ten of them had a bad report. Ten of them said, no, we, we can't take the land. There, there's too many people over there. There's too many Amicites and all kind of, there's too many. And, and all of that, there's some giants in the land. So ten of them came back speaking fear. Let's go to Numbers chapter 14. I want you to see this. This is important. This is a very important part of the message tonight that you get a hold of this part here. Numbers chapter 14, we're going to start off in verse 11. This is, then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? Now this is after the, 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 the 12 spies have came back. And it says, let's go down to verse 21. It says this, But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory, they have seen my signs, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice. Verse 23 says, They certainly shall not see the land which I swore to them, or certainly shall not see the land which I made in my covenant, nor shall any of those who reject me see it. So God was displeased with the outcome of, of the ten people and also that what the other people believed. Are you, are you with me? So they had ten people persuaded them not to, not to go into the land. But there were two. There were two who were covenant-minded. I said there were two people who were covenant-minded. When you're covenant-minded, you believe that God is true, yes, and amen. When you're covenant-minded, your faith doesn't get wavered. You don't speak fear. You don't speak doubt. You don't speak unbelief. You don't live that way when you're covenant-minded. Let's go to verse 29. 
Is that what I want to go to? Yeah, verse 29 it says, the, the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above will not enter the land of Canaan except for Caleb and Joshua. It says, those of you are 20 years and older shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in except for Caleb and Joshua. He made a covenant right there with Caleb and Joshua. Actually, he didn't really have to make that covenant. Joshua and Caleb maintained the covenant they had with Jesus Christ. They maintained the God covenant. Are you with me? Because they said, we're well able to take the land. They came back with a different, a different outcome than what the other ten spies said. Joshua and Caleb said, we're well able to take the land. Didn't he not? Hallelujah. God is a God of covenant relationships. Why? Because he wants us to be covenant-minded. He wants to have a relationship with us. We need to be covenant-minded. Let's go to the Davidic covenant. The high point of God's covenant relationship with man came through his commitment with King David. This was later on through which he promised to rule and reign his people forever. The Davidic covenant, you know that was between David, the king, and Christ. The Davidic covenant refers to God's promise to David that came through Nathan the prophet. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. In verse 10, it says this, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people, Israel, I will plant them that they may dwell in the place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. Verse 11. Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. Verse 12. This is what I want to get to. Listen to this very carefully. And he's telling David, when your days are fulfilled, and you rest with your fathers. I will set up your seed after you. Who will come from your body. And I will establish his kingdom. He's talking about Christ Jesus. He's saying through the bloodline. Through the, through, through the genes of you. I'm gonna, uh, there's going to be a king that's going to come after you. And I will establish his kingdom. I will set up a seed after you. See, what, what I've learned is over time is since Adam and Eve sinned against God, all the Old Testament was orchestrated by God the Father to get Jesus Christ here on this earth. Is that not true? You think about that. All the Old Testament. You go through the covenants and you can see how God maneuvered, orchestrated different people in different situations, all because to get the kingdom, the Son of Man, in the body here on this earth. Mm -mm -mm. I will set up your seed after you. This is a Davidic covenant that was promised. I will set up a seed after you who will come from your body through your bloodline. And verse 13, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This is an unconditional covenant made between God and David, through which God promises David that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, will come from the lineage of David and would establish a kingdom on earth. Not only establish a kingdom, but a kingdom that will last forever. Glory be to God. I said glory be to God. The Davidic covenant is an unconditional promise because God does not place any conditions of obedience upon its fulfillment. It didn't matter what happened after that. God said this is going to happen. And when he said it's going to happen, it's going to happen. There's a seed coming after you that his kingdom 
will be established forever. My God. Hallelujah. Mm -mm -mm. I got to calm down. It's Wednesday night. Glory be to God. Woo. Shonda Honda. Hallelujah. The Davidic covenant is an unconditional promise because God does not place any conditions of obedience upon its fulfillment. The surety of the promise rests solely on God's faithfulness. His word. His promise. His covenant. And does not depend at all on David or Israel's obedience or Israel's disobedience. It doesn't have nothing to do with it. The promise that David's house or David's kingdom and the throne will be established forever is significant because it shows that the Messiah would come from the bloodline of David, from the lineage of David, and that he will establish a kingdom and he will reign and he will rule. God, through the seed of David, ushered in a new and final covenant by which all men can receive the gift of salvation this new covenant is not based on sacrifice of animals it's not based on words written on the tabernacle of stone but this new covenant will be written and received into the hearts of man where the Holy Spirit will dwell forever hallelujah I said, hallelujah. I'm going to say one last thing. We're going to call it. We're going to pick up on this Sunday morning. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection confirmed the faithfulness of God's covenant relationship to mankind. And we, as a church, are partakers of God's covenant. We are partakers of the everlasting covenant having been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb and sealed <laughs> by His Holy Spirit. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That means you have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Whew. Let's all stand tonight. We're going to finish right there. Hallelujah. Glory. Everybody say, I am covenant-minded. Come on, say it like you mean it. I am covenant-minded. Hallelujah. Got to get a hold of God's word. Get a hold of his covenant and our covenant. God is a God of covenant relationships. And when we're obedient, and if you're a God of covenant, if you're a covenant relationship with God, then you are obedient to his word. You don't have any trouble being obedient to God's word when you're in a covenant relationship with the Father. His covenant relationship will keep you out of trouble. Amen? So next time the enemy comes at you, hold it. Time out. I've got a covenant with the Father. And because i got a covenant with the Father, I don't have to do anything you want me to do. Hallelujah! Because you're under my feet. You've already been defeated. Hallelujah! The enemy has been defeated. Glory be to God. Thank you, Holy Spirit.